everybody. Um, just an anecdote from last typo Berlin. When I spoke there, when I went there last time in 2018, I was standing on an empty beer bottle box. I was wearing heels and I brought the smallest possible laptop, my own, which caused me even more trouble like you've just faced. Why so? Because I faced the situation like this, trying to adopt a thing like this. And I decided that the next time that I would encounter a situation like this, I would ju just throw this thing off the stage. Because I cannot probably, you see what happens? I cannot probably work with this. I try to adopt to it. So it actually is, oh, see what happens? Again, I destroyed it. I'm sorry, Esther. I, I can't even touch it. I'm sorry. So, um, I don't throw this thing off the stage, but it's a perfect symbol for things that are actually not designed for all of us. Like we've heard before, like in language, like in type design. Yes, like in type design, but that's the thing. We try and adopt to things, and as I'm a nice person, I try to cope with the situation like this because I want to see you and I want to stand here in a relaxed way and I want to click with my right hand and not stand like this, but I have to stand like this right now and I'm trembling because it makes me totally nervous and I feel like a little strange, awkward diacritic that is like kind of adopting to the situation because there's this big, huge letter that doesn't fit for me. So what can I do? I can try and adopt to the situation, or I could rather, sadly, walk back home, which I won't either. Talking about going back home, before I go home, I need to do this at least. Why so? Because I am here amongst type designers, and it's very much the same at home, as some of you know, and I would have a real bad time if I would go back home without mentioning who made the typefaces. Lucas made the typefaces, and he would be extremely sad and extremely unhappy if I wouldn't mention this. Why so? Very understandably, this guy doesn't want to be referred to as only the husband of the famous artist writer, right? So he made the typefaces, and the typefaces are great, no matter whom he's, who, whom he's uh, uh, married to, and no matter who is saying this. But you see, and uh, although I'm still trembling, I'm still nervous, I think you got the idea that many things in this world, and many typefaces, are designed for a majority of people. And our attitude, our wording, our typefaces, even our grammar, in many cases, contradicts the Constitution. This is a quote from a German feminist linguist from last year. We were facing a lot of headlines like this. Is this even still German? We face a cultural clash around the little stars. We have a star war going on in Germany. Um, some said that it's about the beauty of gendering, but also there are arguments against it. So, to summarize the situation we faced in 2020 and 2021, it was something like this. I hope you have already um, heard about the gender star. This is what the star is referring to. I would have preferred to have a headline like this. And I think up to now it's um, really clear that gender is a verb. It's obviously something we do to people, to words, in situations. So I will try and translate the, yeah, uh, the most heated 
controversy and debate we faced language-wise in German-speaking countries in the last years, which is not easy. Um, first, localizing the word. I al already started with this. Um, gender comes from English um, and refers to the roles that are um, yeah, added to us from society depending on which gender, it's so delicate here, it's so delicate here. You see, it's so hard to even speak about it um, because the whole issue is about speaking in a fair, correct, adequate way with everybody. So the word here is uh, geschlechtergerecht, which I would like to, I try to translate, but I, I, I wouldn't even know how, what would be the appropriate um, word for it. Is it gender fair, gender equal, gender specific, or appropriate? So maybe we could agree to use gender sensitive or even to use language sensitive. And basically I could, like finish here because this is what it's about. If I act and speak and write in a sensitive way, if I look at people, if I listen to them, I would know how to do. I would know how to design typefaces. I would know what is needed, is needed to address everybody in the correct way. Let me go on and illustrate this. The situation in Germany, trying to make this understandable and hoping for some of you to share your experiences with it later. Maybe we have such language and type design situations in other cultures as well. So what do we have here? We have a beautiful logo. Nothing wrong with it. Is there anything wrong with this? It translates, it translates to the uh, center of the Viennese pathfinders and pathfinderesses. Because in German we have male and female endings for nouns, especially for the professions or for, in general for nouns addressing people. Nothing wrong with it. The thing is that some consider this to be too complicated or too long to put it in every logo or on every um, sign or on every poster. So we have, this is basically summarizing the debate we have. This says, I am a hero. So some female hero, heroine, heroine, added the feminine form to it or several to choose from. And you see also that already as, er as early as in 2012 it was, so 10 years ago, the gender star, this symbol for a footnote has been used to indicate that maybe there is more to it than just a hero. Maybe there are more different gender identities telling us that it's not only um, male, one gender dominating the scene. Um, yeah, again, I, 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 I could basically s stop here because the current debate is reduced to should we, and this is of course totally false, it re it's reduced to, the, to, the, to this question, should we just put a gender star at every word in the discussion or should we not? Um, and as with most social or political debates, it's not, it's not as simple as that. So I will try, I will try and sp spread out the background a little bit. And Veronica, you must please stop me at some point if I get too much into details because it's really a, a big thing and I might be taken away and I try to do it quickly or I'll stop at every point and ask if I should go continue. I have case studies, I have typographic issues and stuff. So I continue with the first part and then we see what happens. So what I try to do is to uh, localize the debate or rather ourselves in time and space. Where are we actually in time? We are obviously in the 21st century. We, have, um, we, we face a time of high individualization, which is not, 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 not a natural thing. Um, 
and I could speak about this for an hour, I won't, but today it's normal to really think deeply about one's own identity and not necessarily try and summarize identities within groups. Very um, uh, brutally summarizing this issue. Language is a political issue and we have language debates in the public, not only in Germany, I guess. And this, looks, this is what it looks like um, when there's no when, 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 when there's just a yes and no debate. You see here that the, this is a, a sign close to where I live in Berlin, and you see in the, at the beginning of the second paragraph, you see this word innen with a gender gap. So the female ending has been crossed out, obviously, by some Anwohners who didn't want to it to be in use, and this is really this is really um, an effort they made because this sign is like two and a half meters high. So you must take a friend or or or, or whatever to climb up and to do this. And this lady here is also a new word, die böse wichting. Böse wichting meaning something like um, the. The, the bad guy, but with a female ending, which, which normally doesn't exist, but now it exists. And this is the she's the the uh, editor in chief of the publishing house, which publishes the German Duden, the dictionary. Can you imagine? And she has been attacked. She has really been attacked and giving tons of interviews about the thing, because she has been she's, she's, she has been accused of suppressing the gendering on us. This is what the headlines are about. Must we all gender now? Which is not true because um, normally, normally in democracies, in, I must say, um, language is something that evolves and is being documented. So this is what dictionary normally, dictionaries and language institutions normally do. They document what is going on. Same with this issue. It's different in other cultures. But in Germany, we document. So we have institutions like the Duden, we have institutions like universities, publishing houses, the press, who normally are the ones to, 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 to start uh, changes in language or to notice or to take care for that issue. And we also have design agencies. We'll come back to that later. And we have ourselves. And this is where actually the whole thing comes to the point. We, we every, every, every single self is the best starting point to discuss and to speak and to try and adopt to a development. So let's just take a minute to think, remember um, our individual, your, my, um, linguistic heritage in regards maybe to the gender issue or to other issues. What have we been learning in school from our par parents and our society? What influences have there been? What has been um, encouraging or disturbing or strange or awkward? What did you feel well? What did you not feel, make you feel um, so we'll make a short break here to, for everybody to let sink in. And then I go on and sharing my, my um, experiences. Maybe we can share later. I would love to hear some of yours. So mine were, for example, as follows. I, 
um, Generation Golf. This refers to a book title, to a German book title, but also to a brand. This was the most, um, most sold car by Volkswagen in the 80s and 90s of the last century. So we are influenced by certain brands and how they communicate. Most um, boring part, but still. I'm also Generation Fräulein. This is like, like with freehand. If you say that you are being exposed to this, or and then you um, say that it's long ago, but still, we had this thing in Germany like the French Mademoiselle and, or the Spanish Senorita. I don't know about them, but the German Fräulein defi defi definitely is out of fashion. And it was interesting how quickly that went. And um, I think it was only like two or three, five years maybe, and nobody missed it. And I'm also, I must say, I'm generation N-word. This is me in second grade. You see where the little one is, you see? It's been in use. And it didn't disturb anybody. That was back in Venezuela, so both in German and in English, um, it was okay to use it. So things change within one generation even, they can totally change with words. And we have Generation 8's Chernobyl, Le Wald Sterben, and I think it has also been adopted to other languages, the dying of the woods. We are Generation COVID or Corona. We face extremism today in many, many countries. We have been called Generation X, Y, and Z, and starting again all over, and we have the East and the West. And the thing is that today, when I look at the audience, I see people I know, Pablo is in his early 20s, um, um, here people like from t three, four, maybe five um, decades. So today we speak, when we speak with our parents, our grandparents, we speak with post-war children and millenniums. And this is a big, huge span with many different, many different experiences, language-wise. Yeah, we face something like political correctness, which I don't like at all, and we face some spelling reforms, actually, that are not so important so, um, until now. So, to summarize these questions, um, or to, to lead to the next step, we should ask ourselves, language-wise and design-wise, what do we actually want to achieve with what we do, with how we speak, with how we write, or what do we actually, basically, want? So this is my coming out here, I want this. I want feminism for all. It looks a bit dusty and rusty today, but I'm very sure, and again, I could speak like two hours about, also about the gender debate, details going on at the moment and transition, much more transition from female to male and so on. And I could talk about wars being arised as far as I know, not so many of them by non-male people. So I would like to make feminism fun again and flourish again. And I would like to raise some more questions. Do I want to be understood? This question is interesting because from, to me it was, it was really, <laughs> it was really um, understood that I want to be understood when I speak and write, but for many it seems not. We could refer to fake news here as well, but we can also refer to the fact that some people say, I learned this and that, this and that back in school. For example, I learned the N-word, I learned whatever. So for me it's right, and I don't mean it um, in an offensive way if I use this wording. I don't mean it in an offensive way if I speak of only Mitarbeiter, the male form of employees in German. I learned this. It's a generic masculine. It's natural to me. But the thing is that you would not be understood any longer today. If I would speak like this with my students, I would give them a bad impression. And they say, they say to me, this would not fit your wording. It's very much the same with other wording. I, I can only recommend check with young people 
and check with elder people as well. And then respond to it. Am I speaking for myself or for many? Am I speaking for my company, my team, maybe? Whom exactly do I address? Whom exactly do I mean? Who am I talking about? Do I really mean, include and address everybody seriously if I speak only in the male form? Do I really address non-male employees here, Verkäufer saying shop assistant in German. And you see this MWD, um, very small, included here, which says male, female, diverse in German. It's supposed to, but I wonder if it's really being seen here. This is also very interesting. They are looking for female shop assistants in the first place, obviously, because this is le le the, the common thing. We have female shop assistants in Germany, and then they added the little male pronoun here, which is totally, which makes it is a bit disturbing. Also, they have um, potato soup on the right poster, and you see only sausages in the back. I find it really um, a disturbing bit of information. This is also interesting. They also worked with the MWD, so the male, female, diverse um, uh, thing. But in the, in the main um, job descriptions, they used the female and the male um, Berufsbezeichnungen. Berufsbezeichnungen in English. Job descriptions. job descriptions, thank you very much. This caused quite a fun debate on Twitter, especially because they had the chief editor in the female form, I guess. So, do I want new, young, diverse target groups? This is interesting for um, companies, of course. Do I actually want more women on the team? Then please address them, because otherwise they won't, they, it's proven, they will not, not that much women will apply if you want, not even for speakers, if you don't not actively encourage them, or at least address them. If you don't want to work with more women on your team, okay, admit it. Do I want more female employees, clients? I, get, I guess you got the idea so far. Women on the board, etc. Here it becomes really interesting. What do I risk? What do I gain? What am I actually afraid of? So of all of these questions, I think this is really the most interesting. What can I gain? What do I risk? What do I risk if I don't adopt to the new understanding? Are we still okay finding some answers now? Well, it might be interesting to understand how, what we can learn from all this debate in Germany to, mm -hmm. to other cultures. So is there, I don't know, have you found um, or talked with people in, in other languages, in other countries, um, how they, how they yeah. either deal with that, if it's an issue at all? Yeah. Um, I took the chance, but with my students, um, and I found some little examples from, I remember back then talking about Spanish, about the niños and the niñas thing, mm -hmm. that if you have a huge group of um, male and female yeah, yeah. people, and just one boy or guy, it's always niños and so on. Um, this is one thing. And I found it interesting that I heard that in the UK, um, women actresses, actresses, um, like it better to be called actors, so to exactly do the other thing, to, to, to not be named, to not be marked as women. And I also heard, last year I heard from, um, actually, um, maybe you know better than I about this um, rule in the Czech Republic being abolished, that the female ending in the last name must always be mentioned. Do you know about that? It's not, not obligatory anymore. So it's an interesting thing that um, in different language systems, societies, different solutions are being discussed or tried out for addressing everybody properly and especially for addressing women. This is, yeah, there's a comment from Shani. 
the, the box, the box, the box, throw the box, throw the box, throw the box. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much um, for um, addressing this issue. Um, Hebrew is gendered, mm -hmm. and I grew up speaking Hebrew, so in my books, the doctor is a man, the nurse is a woman. Uh, of course, there's a, two genders, um, so on and so forth. Recently, there is a movement to change the language, to represent uh, all the genders, and as every, uh, you know, change, it's very scary, especially for the people in power. Um, there are several typographic ways to deal with it um, because, and I, I, I think it's the same from what I understand, sentences are getting very long if you address both uh, mm. the genders, right? Especially if it's plural. Mm. So Same here. Right, so you're trying to add things. Yeah. Uh, in Hebrew, we either add um, a, a dot and then the feminine after, the male is first, the feminine mm -hmm. after, or a slash. Um, visually, I prefer the dot. I see mm -hmm. slash, I'm still mm -hmm. happy because both, or in an effort for more genders to be represented in the language, and I think we know what it means um, or how it feels, or we, kind of, we can understand how it feels not to be represented in your mm. language. I think this is why this change is so scary, because I, um, I know that even if um, I go into my bank account and I want to do some actions and they, um, I, I read the mail um, actions that I'm supposed to do, I know that they mean um, that it's in, the language is also for female. And in job descriptions, there'll be a note saying this is um, written in the mail form, but it addresses uh, we have the, the same thing right. here. So there, just to share kind of a few examples uh, that are kind of currently going on, uh, we have one politician who just speaks only in female um, verbs, and of course she's being mocked, and you know everybody kind of really likes to pick on her. Um, I tried that for a while. I love it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think the people that it, you know it kind of it stops you. It makes you feel, and if you are male and you are all of a sudden feel, oh, maybe I'm not represented now. Are you talking to me? Are you not talking to me? So it's, I, it's just interesting, right, to see uh, what happens in that space. And I know that personally, um, um, recently I had to uh, translate a text from English to Hebrew, and I was spending a lot of time. It was kind of a complicated text. I, didn't, I tried to do the longer version. It didn't really work, and I decided to do to use the note thing reverse. So before the text started, I wrote this uh, is um, 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 written in the female form, but it applies to all the gendered. Um, what happened? <laughs> I don't know. I need to. <laughs> I need. I need to check. But the the, the people who I worked with was yeah. you know very understanding and kind of thanked me for you know opening um, this up because of course there's not. We don't know if it's not our language. We don't. We usually don't know. Um, I so these are kind of things from from my world and my language. And I just want to uh, just share a little anecdote because I'm I'm trying to follow this uh, as much as I can. Uh, and there's a movement and there are groups that are very active um, on this subject in Israel. And the last thing that I I saw as an example that really resonated with me was a uh, television interview with um, pregnancy specialists. She, a, what? a pregnancy specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a doctor, and she described what happens to you when you are pregnant and when you give birth to a baby. But she described everything in the male form. Mm. Now, and you know, mm. uh, people who identify as men can get pregnant and can can have babies. But it was like, what? What's going on? Why are you doing this? It, and I, I, I think it's 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 gr a great question. And I think the more the the more we communicate that, and the more we kind of use different solutions, maybe you know um, we can start this evolution. And uh, and and the best solution will win. I don't know. Thank you. I bet. Yeah. I very much like the generic feminine. 
you know why? Because when you look at the words, at these longer words, I guess in many languages, you see that the, you see a long word in the generic family and you see that the male form is really included within the word. So, yeah, yeah, which is very interesting. I can, quick, maybe it's a good time to share the typographic examples or the handwritten examples. This is the first gender star I found in the wild, beautifully handwritten, dear neighbor restless. I have found a dried seahorse in the backyard. Whom is it? I love this, this thing. So you can adopt the thing to individual situations. And it's always about finding a solution which is, like Shani just said it with her examples, coherent for me now because it's so much in transition. And yes, we do have books, the first book being published last year from an ex-student of mine um, about the different gender signs, the topographic signs that are, that are in use. And um, she also made this poster summarizing, summarizing the forms that are being in use. And she listed all the detailed information about binary and non-binary forms and all the stuff to it. So it's really um, useful material to spread the news. And I added the middle dot to it, by the way. I love it too. Ligatures. A gender ligature being designed. I found this interesting. And I also find it very interesting that this designer is explicitly um, stating herself as a political, cultural, and feminist designer working in about non-binary language and typography. Examples from universities. And you see it here that with the plural it gets really a bit strange, also because the German word innen means inside. A very variable addition. And as early as in 92, a Dutch guy, have you heard of him? It's really crazy. He only he made this suggestion that everything should just address with a EY at the end and use the neutral article. So in the plural, it would be die Deutsches. Italians could be addressed as the Deutsches, maybe, the Lesis, and so on. And, uh, but this is our, this are actually the, the, the most used common forms. And I really love the medio dot as well, the middle dot. I totally love it for many reasons because it is used, actually most of all, because it is used in a function that is really close to the function. It is being used in the with the gendering. It's from um, simple language. It indicates word divisions or word combinations and marks the part of a word. And it's um, not as much being used as, for example, the colon, or the star. I don't like the star that much because the star, for me, is a, is a footnote. And I don't want to be addressed as a footnote. I guess nobody want, would, Boris, would you want to be addressed? Like, okay, we can agree on that. So, this is how the centered point or middle dot is being written. You can check this easily and it's so quick and easy to learn. It's much easier than many other micro typographical signs. It's super easy. Look it up. I use it since two years. Typograph, I don't put it here because Boris is standing here. I, I put it there before. So type, typography. Um, people use it gladly, and also editors in Germany and Austria. I was very proud that this Austrian editor said he found it on Twitter. Basi I, I'm sure he found it on my account back then, and he finds it very elegant. And I see it being used in cultural newsletters and contexts very much, most of them actually at the moment. So some proof of this. This is the state of the art now, and we also have some possibility of addressing this in our verbal language. We have a thing called the glottal stop. Guess you heard of this? Beautiful long words in German we have. 
I just wanted to share them for the pure beauty of them. Stimmritzenverschluss laut, Einschaltknack, Kehlkopfverschluss laut, Glottisverschluss laut, Knack laut. It's a glottal plosive. I like that also. It's a little stop you make when speaking. And it's being used as the gender pause, we call it. Do you have it in other languages as well? The gender pause? Or is this German specific? It's, like, it's, it's, it's a thing we, we have in German. It's nothing new, actually. If, you, if we have words like this, you wouldn't know how to pronounce it, right? Or this here. Is it, is it, actually, is it actually a Spiegelei? A Spiegelei or a Spiegelei? Meaning two things. A Spiegelei is a, a, Spiegelei is a re reflection and a Spiegel eye is a fried egg. So you need some context or some information about how to spell words. And in easy language, in simple language, you would need this dot to indicate which one is meant. It's about word recognition. It's about preciseness. Do I, have the, do I use the female form? Do I address a, a group of female writers? Or am I referring to female, male, and whatever gendered writers? It's something, it's something typical for the German language. Um, but it's being, f it's being F fight and fought against. People say it's ugly. And if it's so ugly, why then not use the generic feminine for a change? Easy one. So this is the, this is the most common form, summarizing them again, that's, uh, that are in use today. Um, and really in use in many, many, many contexts and newspapers. And it's spoken with a little pause. And to summarize this, and you can just see it, see it immediately, the problem is if you do this consequently, without changing anything in your language, it looks terrible. It sounds terrible also. I won't read this. And it's, been con it's, it's confusing because this, here the gender sign, the colon being used as a gender sign is, is easily confused with the colon used as a colon. So this is the problem. It's inelegant. It disturbs the flow of reading. It's difficult to get used to when writing and speaking. The characters already have other functions. And important, the effect is questionable. Most of all, typographic, uh, no, the characters, are, the characters have other functions. I said this before. The effect is questionable. And typographic gender signs also serve as codes to separate groups from each other. So they have an, an air of exclusiveness about them, and they can be even more polarizing. So um, we achieve the opposite of what we want. It's not integrating at all, but separating. There are other possibilities, obviously, and this is also a good moment maybe to, to open up discussion again. Are there other linguistic possibilities? Nadine wanted to share something. Yeah. Okay. Um, it might be a problem with the colon that the colon was spaced as a separating character rather than a joining character. So if we look at the L with a dot, the, the Catalan one, the dot is placed so that it does not break the word. Yeah. Like when you read parallel in, in Catalan, it's, yeah. yeah. So you would need those marks, whether it is the colon or the midpoint or asterisk or whatever it is, to be spaced to combine letters rather mm. than to be a device, because normally punctuation is there to signify a certain type of stop when you are speaking. So we'll need a differently spaced one, I guess. Um, that reminds me of one thing I forgot to mention. The middle dot is not being separated in hashtags, which is super useful. Slide out. Slide out. Ah, okay. But I got the box. Okay, sorry. You I, want, I want to say something. One, one last question. Oh, okay. I, I, I skip. I, I go to the final thing now. Maybe skip the hypertypographic thing. Because you yes. did this wonderful thing in your talk where you, you paused. And I think that was really useful because it, it essentially you gave us the space to reflect halfway through this. And that is that was very useful for me. Uh, there are indeed particular challenges in each specific culture. I speak this with one language that is heavily gendered and one that isn't explicitly in my mind at the same time. And 
I'm also sharing generational cues with you. So I think we ha I can see the problem of being sort of in the middle of the uh, demographic pyramid. Uh, something that uh, I didn't hear here, which I think is relevant, but is very much current in the conversation in the UK, is that of allyship. And I don't know how it translates to German, but it, it is the idea of people who don't identify as belonging to a group making visible their support for the perspective of that group. Mm. It might be as small as me having a pride sticker on my laptop, even though I'm cisgendered. Uh, and it might have to do with how I address people and so on. So in a sense, uh, by visibly making uh, the effort, it might be a very small effort, it might be a bigger effort to try to show that I'm making an effort to recognize somebody else's perspective, even if I get it wrong half of the time at least. Uh, that empowers then the person in that mm -hmm. point of view to feel that they are more respected, to feel that they are more given space to express their view. And I think as long as I recognize that it's okay for me to get it wrong, because I can't really understand deeply other perspectives, but I am making an effort to change my behavior, uh, especially in things where I need to open up and take guidance and listen to people. And I think the key thing in allyship is that I'm, I'm open to listening and you correcting me how to pronounce somebody's name or how to address someone and so on and learn the new vocabulary. I think that's at the heart of a lot of this uh, and where we need to take advantage of the fact that we are an extremely mixed bag. We are very international. A lot of us have multiple identities. We are all, I like very much the term of moderate otherness for a lot of us. That mm. uh, We have multiple identities depending on the spheres we circulate. And we have to remember that it's okay if we don't get it right. It's okay if we struggle with longer expressions and the wrong symbols and so on. But as long as we make the effort, uh, echoing others yesterday, uh, and then keep making the effort until something emerges. Yes, but uh, you know what the problem is? Um, change does only happen if somebody starts it. And change is started, always started, from groups who need change. And the groups who need change are minorities, right? This is not by me, this is by some French philosopher, um, I don't remember whom it was. So if a minority starts and tries to start a change, the minority needs the support of the majority. In the case of gendering, it's interesting because women, or let's say non-males, are not a minority number-wise. They, I guess, are even the majority. But we strongly, what we can do, if, if that was the, yeah. the question, what, what can we actually do? You, as a male person, can do much more than I. And this is why I quickly switch to the role models here. My, my, my friend Martin, for example, he's speaking in the generic feminine since 20 or 30 years. And he clearly states this is a political issue. And I asked him 15 years ago, do you, have on, do, do you only have girls amongst your students? Because he kept speaking about studentinnen. And he said, no, but I use the generic feminine for a change. You should use it for like 10,000 years. And we have other people here, like this lady. I must quickly, please give me two more minutes, please. Please, I must mention her. My favorite role model in this context is Marlies Kremer. She was born in 37, a super normal German housewife, working as a housewife, raising kids, and when she faced, her husband died at some point, and when she faced pension, she saw her pension, and then she got angry, really, really angry. And then, next thing was, she saw her passport, and she got even more angry, because in her passport it said, Pass in Haber. So she responded in a very personal way to this issue, saying, I worked like 30 or 40 years, I raised the kids, I worked very hard, I'm, I'm receiving a, 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 a horrible little small pension, and I'm not even addressed properly. She was the one to succeed, that, they had, that we have the female form in the past first, and she also was the one to succeed in um, naming whether highs and lows alphabetically, because bef before in Germany we had the weather highs being named with male names, 
and their lows, so the storms, the thunderstorms, and the depressing gray clouds were the women names. Can't you believe it? It's really true. So, if you allow, I can just summarize the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> Sharing that we have people who avoid the topic at all, and they speak and live and write gender neutral. And this chart, we have gender sensitivity and diversity in design. It's just starting, not only in language. And I, what I wanted to say as a conclusion or recommendation or a learning is this thing here. We need only three things, like with every design issue, to clarify our position, to make clear decisions, to please take creative action in language, like in other fields, because it's a tool. Language is a design tool. Writing is design, join my workshop. Text is language designed, visually and verbally, because it creates identity only if it goes together, right? Dankeschön. <laughs>